All right, guys, so we are continuing in 1 John chapter 2, uh, starting at verse 15. And uh, I want to just kind of walk through this passage, make sure we really understand it. Uh, I'm not going to get so much into application. I hope that you guys have been going through it yourself and really seeking God on where is he leading you? What does obedience look like for you in your life? And remember those five questions that I've been trying to encourage you guys in of, um, you know, who is God? from this passage. What has he done? What does he say about us, about me, you know, you in particular, me, you know, and then based on those things, what do I need to do? And then the fifth question, how do I do it? Uh, hopefully you're going through I ate them and you're seeing those. And then I actually added a sixth question because I do six days on I, I ate them of who do I need to share this with? Um, just to get you guys thinking in terms of, all right, there's, there's things I'm learning here. There's, there's things that God's teaching me. There's things that I'm applying to my life. Well, he wants me to share that with others. He wants me to teach other people and, and let them see and know how God's working in my life. Um, maybe there's somebody close to you. You're like, wow, this really is applicable to them. Um, so I want you guys to be thinking that way. All right, so walking through uh, 1 John chapter 2, uh, verses 15 through 27. First point I want to make is that there is this love that leads to death that's in competition with a love that leads to life. So is all love a good love? Um, look at what he says, verse 15. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Now keep in mind, when he says world, he is talking about uh, the world of evil because the same author wrote John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whosoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. So clearly John 3, 16, he's talking about people. He's talking about creation. And of course, at the center of cre God's creation is humanity uh, made in the image of God, male and female. Um, so he's going to get into it a little bit here in a second, this, what is he, this kind of world and love for the world that's not good, but he's very clear that if anyone loves the world, the love of the father is not in him. The love of the father and the love of the world are incompatible loves. It's like oil and water. They don't mix. They can't be together. Next verse for everything in the world. Now we get a little under, more understanding what he means by the word world, because he's not saying uh, what God's created. There's, there's a different thing. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride in one's possessions is not from the Father, but is from the world. And again, getting to that sort, the idea of the source. God is love. Uh, we've already seen if, if you love your brother, that's proof that, that the love of the Father is in you. Think of Think of love like a, uh, like a resource or a commodity. Uh, it, it, it's, or think of it like, you know, oil coming out of an oil well. You know, it's, it's a well of love that overflows from God into our life that allows us to love other people. And that's where it comes from. It comes from the Father. What doesn't come from the Father? These, these three things. And a lot could be said about this, but one thing that's interesting to note is that these are the, this is the same like core things that we saw from Genesis 3. Look at Genesis chapter 3, verse 6. I've got it on the screen. The woman, Eve, saw that the tree was good for food and a delight to look at and that it was desirable for obtaining wisdom. We get all three of those three types of, of, of desires that are sinful uh, are, are right there as well. Possessions, wisdom, uh, delight to the eye, uh, desire from her flesh to get that. So she took some of its fruit, ate it, and she also gave it to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. You guys could break that down a little bit more. A lot could be said on that. Verse 17, and the world with its lust is passing away, but the one who does the will of God remains forever. And that's where I got this idea that one leads to death and one leads to life. And I say lead because it really is leading. And I think one key thing to understand and the distinction between a bad love and good love is, is it, is, 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 is it in following it? Am I going away from God? So uh, I think all loves, 
that are good, that are from God, are always in line with God. And when we are following God, we are loving the people around us, uh, loving God's creation in a healthy and appropriate level that doesn't uh, any of those things go above who God is and, and the love that we should have for God. And I think it's also a really good measure of, of really, like, am I being driven by the lust of my flesh, lust of my eyes, uh, desire for possessions? Well, it's about obedience. Am, am I obeying those things? And, and is that driving me in a certain direction? Well, that, that tells me that I'm loving those things. I'm not loving God. I'm loving those things. Anyway, a lot, a lot more could be said, but you guys can, can walk through that. And then the second point kind of goes into the second section. There's a lot here. Watch out for antichrists. They say three things. Jesus is not the Christ. There is no father and son. Spiritual knowledge is only for the elite. So much could be broken down out of this little section here. But just as a way of background to understand, um, scholars believe that 1 John's letter, it has a lot positive to say. Here we're getting a little bit of the clue into the negative that he's trying to say. He's confronting dis a, a kind of heresy and disbelief that was invading the Christians that were he was writing this to. Um, and, and scholars believe it was an early kind of Gnosticism. Now, Gnosticism didn't really fully mature until I think at least another 100 years after uh, this time. But there were early forms of it. And Gnosticism, at the core of it, believed that all matter, in other words, the physical, all matter is evil and all of the spiritual is good. So, because of that, they denied this idea of the incarnation of God. God the Father is spirit. Jesus is the incarnate God. In other words, the spirit of God in a human flesh. So if, if matter, if flesh is all bad, even though Genesis makes it clear that God created everything and he said it was good, um, then it's not possible for a good God to be in an evil body. Um, they deny that, that idea. And then there were a lot of other things that come along with that. And we'll, we'll break this down. But you'll see that to be an antichrist is someone to deny some of these most fundamental things that God says about himself. These three things in particular. Not limited to just that, but that, th those are the things that he's going after right here. So I'm just trying to help you guys understand that. Let's look at some key verses uh, in this passage. He says, but you have an anointing from the Holy One. That's a reference to the, the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. And all of you know the truth. A big part of Gnosticism was this idea that we attain enlightenment through knowledge. And this knowledge is only uh, available from and, and, and uh, known by certain elite uh, people. Um, so you're always subservient to those people trying to find and, and get the knowledge. And he's saying, guys, you have the Holy Spirit in you that has given you what you need to know, the most fundamental thing you need to know, which is the truth of the gospel. He says, verse 21, I have not written to you because you don't know the truth, because you do know it. Guys, don't, don't let someone tell you that you don't understand the gospel. And because no lie comes from the truth. Who is the liar? If not the one who denies that Jesus is the Christ. Christ is the Greek term. It's a, it's a label. It's a title for Jesus. The Hebrew version of it was Messiah. Jesus is the Savior. Jesus is the Christ. He's not just some guy. So someone who is an antichrist is somebody that's denying that. Um, this one is the antichrist, the one who denies the Father and the Son. And right in these passages, we see a reference to the Holy Spirit. We see a reference to the Son. We see a reference to the Father, the 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 doctrine that's beyond our ability to fully understand, but we get a hint at it of, of one God that is in three persons, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And Antichrist in particular is someone that denies 
that there's such a thing as the Son, as the Father, or that Jesus is the Christ. And then going on, no one who denies the Son has the Father. He who confesses the Son has the Father as well. There isn't a, uh, you know, a couple things to acknowledge there is that, is that this is an essential part of Christianity and the teaching of, 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 that God's given us and revealed to us through Scripture. To deny the identity of who Jesus is, is to deny a fundamental thing that makes someone a little version of the Antichrist. And then um, skipping down a couple verses. As for you, the anointing you receive from him remains in you and you don't need anyone to teach you. Instead, his anointing teaches you about all things and is true and is not a lie. Just as it has taught you, remain in him. And this is getting to that idea of like the knowledge that the Holy Spirit gives us in terms of the gospel, the truth, the basic truth of the gospel, that I am a sinner in need of a savior created by God, but, but walked away from God, that he makes it possible through Jesus Christ to come back to him. That is a knowledge that he has revealed to us. I don't need some kind of special elite, um, only you know the most knowledgeable pastors or scholars or people that can read Greek or Hebrew or whatever it might be. Only those people really know the knowledge. No, the truth of the gospel is something that even a child can grasp. Now, this idea, we can't take, he's not meaning here that there's no need for teachers. I think we teach everybody. He's teaching them with this letter. This is a letter that's teaching them. He's, he's going after a particular kind of, of bad teaching that's infiltrated the church at that time that's saying, hey, look, there's not something special that, 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 that I have or that this guru has or whatever that you can only get from them. And that's not true. That is not true. The Holy Spirit, in terms of the fundamental, most important thing that you need to know, the gospel has given that to you. You know that. Don't let anybody tell you different. You've got what you need in the gospel. So those are the main two things that, that I just kind of summarize in this passage. Hopefully that's helpful for you guys. But again, I want you guys to, to don't just in your discussion on Sunday, um, just talk about the passage, but really try to dig in. Okay, do we understand what God's saying? And how is he speaking to me? How do I need to be obedient to him? Maybe in terms of action, deed, maybe obedient to him in terms of a wrong belief that I need to repent and, and turn back to him. Maybe when we're talking about those, those um, the love of the world, is there something that of the world that I obey? As soon as that gets in front of me, I have to obey it and I'm following it. That is a, that is a clue that that obedience is, is, is showing me that there is a love of the world that's not compatible with a love for God. Because when I love God, I follow and obey Him. Anyway, go through that. Looking forward to Sunday um, and, and what you guys uh, learn out of this and how this passage teaches you. And let's remember to listen to Jesus, do what He says, and know that you are loved.